There we go. Okay, it should be recording now. Alexandra, if you want to start. All right, good morning, everybody, to the gathering on Zoom. We're glad you were able to join us today. Interaction is invited in today's service. Please use the reaction icons or the chat feature to interact during the service since we are being recorded. You're still welcome to get refreshments. You just have to go into your own kitchen or wherever you keep your snacks to get them. So fall festival is October 3rd. Session agreed to have a very limited uh, fall festival this year, but keep an eye out for more details coming in the Friday announcements. Confirmation is happening this year, open to any students in seventh or eighth grade. Informational meeting is at four o'clock on September 13th outside at the lower pre preschool entrance. And if you have a student who is of confirmation age, you will receive a letter in the mail this week with details. So keep an eye out for that. Parents, parent meetings are back on Zoom. Woohoo! It's the first Wednesday of the month only. So it starts this Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. It's open to any parent with children at home, and the Zoom link is in the Friday announcements. And last note here, core youth group meets tonight from 6 to 8 outdoors. So that is all the announcements I have for you, and let's come together and sing our first song, Cornerstone.
Okay, my friends, we skipped ahead a little bit, but as we come now to our prayer of confession, let us open our minds and clear our hearts as we listen for the word of God, as we confess our sin unto God and our sins unto one another. Let us pray. The Father, we have sought meeting in shallow places. We have clung to old hurts and familiar habits. We have nursed anger and envy. We have been self-absorbed and lack compassion. We have turned our backs on those in need. Forgive what we have been, amend who we are, and guide us toward what we may become according to your grace. Father, we ask now that you would hear our individual prayers of confession in this moment of silence. Amen. My friends, in the waters of our baptism, God claimed us as his own. In his son, Jesus Christ, our sins have been washed away. Gone is the old life, for Christ has given us new life. Alleluia. Amen. My friends, we come now to our time of sharing the passing of the peace and fellowship. And as been, has been our practice, uh, we will wave to each other during this time. And uh, as a people who know the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us take this time to share that love with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Peace, everybody. And now we come to uh, a time of uh, Word with Children, and Pastor Don, I believe today, is going to share that message uh, with any of the children that may be present, and even some of the older children. Yeah, this one is actually for all God's children, and uh, particularly for uh, those who have a little trouble waking up in the morning, as I do. So a question for you all, what, and I'd like you to use your chat field to type in your answers here, your response, but what do you all drink in the morning to get you going? And this is for the kids as well. So uh, the folks, if you've got, if you've got young ones there, um, Adam, if, if your family too, you, you want to get their responses in there, in there as well. John, you too. Let's see what we got here. So we got water and orange juice. Okay, we've got, uh, let's see, oolong tea. I think I know who did that one, Emma. More water, green tea. Good for you, Emily Krebs. Chocolate milk, Brian, very nice, okay. Water and milk, okay, fair enough. And then for the adults, coffee. Adam, amen to that. Uh, Chad's soda. <laughs> okay, it's all right, it's all right. And then lots of coffee for the parents, yeah. Oh, and we've got a tea drinker there, Susan. Well done. Okay. Jane drinks water. Okay. Coffee and water for George and Grace. We've got some pink lemonade and hot tea. Man, you people are all over the map here. So, I, for me, um, clearly it is coffee. And I, 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 I love coffee. I am, and I imagine that for those of you who have a favorite uh, beverage in the morning to get you going, you're pretty particular about it. And um, Emma can tell you that I am exactly that way when it comes to coffee in the morning. In fact, coffee at any time, to be honest with you. So the perfect cup of coffee for me is four parts dark roast coffee and one part of either whole milk or 2% milk. The 
challenge with the milk is that it can't be so much that it overpowers the coffee and it, and it can't cool it down because it really has to be, for me, hot. But a few years ago, I discovered that in the summertime, I actually enjoyed iced coffee. Do any of you ever drink iced coffee? You can just nod or have you had it? Jane is looking at me and shaking her head and thinking that that's just a <laughs> no-no. But I'll tell you, I, when I was commuting into the city, um, iced coffee on the train was delicious, great. But that, that too, it had to be really cold. So for me, the coffee has to be either really hot or really cold. And I imagine some of you who are in, enjoy tea and, and whatnot have some similar feelings about that. But the key here is that it can't be lukewarm. And if, it's, if it is lukewarm, right, and for the kids, lukewarm means neither hot nor cold, it's just no good, right? It, and it could be so, so much better. It's such a waste, right? Well, that is Jesus' message to the church in Laodicea today in our scripture reading. And this is a congregation that, as Jane is going to tell us, is quite wealthy, and they have a lot of material gifts and blessings. But when it comes to Christ, they are, as Christ says in this vision, they are lukewarm. They're neither hot nor cold. So they want to be disciples and follow Jesus, but because they're so comfortable and so wealthy, frankly, they feel like, well, we don't really need anything. So what that means is, since they don't think they need anything, for them, that includes Christ. So sometimes, part of them, they would like to be disciples of Jesus, but they are not, the other time, they're not willing to risk everything the way Jesus asks us to do. Well, that, of course, is not what Jesus wants. And what Jesus wants for them is to do indeed risk everything for him, to be his disciples. So the obvious point here is that that's what he wants us to do, too. Right? He wants us to be able to risk everything. And I'm curious if some of the kids have some idea what that might look like, for example, at school. What might it be if Jesus tells us that we are supposed to risk everything? Go ahead and type that into the chat field if you have any ideas there. What might that look like? And you can, you can just shout that out to your folks and your folks will type it in. But what would it mean, for example, if you see somebody being bullied, right? And or if you see people doing things that are wrong, maybe cheating on a test or simply butting in line in front of other people. Curious to see what, what responses you have for this. I'll give you a chance to type some of those in. I can see Adam typing and Nathan, I don't know if you have any ideas. And John, you're talking to the girls too, I can see. Go ahead and type those in if you would. Oh boy, Adam said, yeah, Tracy, Tracy says, speak up. Amen to that. You have to say something. And it's risky, right? It's a little risky to do that. And also try to talk the bully out of it. Oh, duh, that's a great one. That's a really good one. A very Christian response, right? Somebody who looks like the enemy, but we're supposed to love them too. That's a really, really good response. Thank you for that. So for the rest of us, I'll leave it up to you. What does that look like in your life? What does it look like to risk all for Jesus? Well, we'll find out a little bit later today. So. All right. Thank you, Don. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Hear now the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. 
you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now, O oh Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we might be open to your word preached this day and that it might change who we are, that we might live more fully into your calling upon our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Let me get the sermon up here. The year was 1994. A woman's marriage had collapsed. She moved to Edinburgh, Scotland with her four month old baby. She had few friends there and not many possibilities. She had no money and so she ended up on welfare. And she had always thought of herself as a writer, but she had never published anything. She didn't have a lot of time. She needed to write quickly or nothing was going to happen for her. And so each day she would take her baby for a walk and wait until she fell asleep. And then she would go into a coffee shop or a restaurant to write. Her favorite place was Nicholson's restaurant because they let her stay for hours buying only one cup of coffee. Well, finally, she had a manuscript. She submitted it and was turned down by four or five publishers. They said it was too long for a children's book. So she looked for a literary agent and she liked the sound of Christopher Little's name. So she sent him the manuscript. Well, for literary agents, unsolicited manuscripts go into what they call the slush pile. And so Mr. Little was on his way to lunch one day and picked up the slush pile and stuck it in his bag. And as it turns out, his lunch date that day was a little late. So he began reading this manuscript that he had just received. And he knew immediately that he had something. Several more publishers turned the manuscript down until Bloomsbury finally bought it. And the stories grew through word of mouth of kids on the playground until now, today, more than 500 books have been sold worldwide. This is, of course, the story of the Harry Potter books and the author J.K. Rowling. You know, Rowling took a risk on herself and on her ability. She had always wanted to be a writer, but she had never told her parents. Christopher Little, the literary agent, took a risk, and so did Bloomsbury Publisher. Well, today's text also calls for a certain level of risk. 
You see, this message to the church at Laodicea is not a happy one. In order to understand it, we have to understand the city itself. As Don told us a few minutes ago, Laodicea was the wealthiest city in the whole region of Phrygia. This city was so rich that it rebuilt itself after a big earthquake, refusing imperial funds. Laodicea was located at a crossroads of a bustling trade route. The people had access and connections throughout the region. This gave a lot of opportunity and a lot of resources. It was also a business hub for textiles, banking, and medicinal industries. There was even a medical school located in the city. They were known for their black wool and their eye salve in Laodicea. But to whom much is given, much will be required, as Luke tells us. You see, the Laodiceans saw themselves as being without need, but spiritually speaking, they actually had great need. The problem is that they had become indifferent. So much so that John says that he would rather they be hot or cold, one or the other, anything except the lukewarm that they were. But Laodicea did have one material need in their city, and that was the need for water. The city, you see, had no water source of its own, and so this meant that they had to pipe water in from the medicinal hot springs in Hierapolis, which was about six miles away. And by the time it arrived in Laodicea, it was tepid, it was lukewarm, and the mineral deposits made it taste absolutely disgusting. So much so that people tended to spit it from their mouths. Well, this is the background for our passage today. And it gives us a vivid description of how the Laodiceans would have heard this text. They knew how awful their own water tasted. And this was just the comparison they needed to understand just how indifferent their faith had become. That happens to all of us, you know. Our faith, too, has become indifferent. Many of us would choose to read any book except the Bible. We care more about what other people think of us than about talking about our faith. We would rather not sing too loudly in case someone should hear how awful our voice sounds or worse, what we're singing. We would rather go to the Church of St. Mattress or spend a day on the golf course than worship the living God. Most of us can think of ways in which our faith has become lukewarm. And like the Laodiceans, we don't often even realize that we are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. But that's not where I want for us to dwell today. Where I want for us to dwell is in the knowledge that Christ is only harsh toward those whom he loves. This passage is meant not only to teach, but to witness for the lordship of Jesus Christ. Over the last seven weeks, we've learned what it means to bear faithful witness. And today, as we wrap up our sermon series, I just want to review for a moment. We learned from Ephesus that faithful witness means repentance. We learned from Smyrna that faithful witness means building a culture of resurrection. We learned from Pergamum that faithful witness means putting God's desires before our own. 
We learned from Thyatira that faithful witness means purposeful outreach to those captivated by cultural idols. We learned from the church at Sardis that faithful witness means authenticity. We learned from the church at Philadelphia that faithful witness means that we just keep going. And today, from the church at Laodicea, we learned that faithful witness means that we declare ourselves to be clearly and unmistakably for Christ in all that we say and do. Even though we mess up or others sin against us, we declare that we are God's beloved children. Even in our lukewarmness, which we know to be the worst of the worst, even then, God loves us still. There is redemption. So the real question is not what are the ways that we need Jesus, because deep down we all know that we need Jesus. The question then becomes, what are we going to do about it? What are we willing to do to respond to our own spiritual need? How will we respond to God's call to us to be disciples of Jesus Christ? Being a disciple isn't for the faint of heart, you know. It's work. It means putting ourselves out there for Christ's sake and being willing to live in a way that is different from the rest of the world. It's a huge risk. In fact, studies have shown that increased spiritual practice coincides with reduction in negative, risky, and moral behaviors like smoking, experimenting with drugs, and experimenting with alcohol. But faith in God can also encourage people to take greater risks than they normally would, because we see God as someone who will protect us. Not all risks result in something that we would consider to be successful, but they do help us learn. And when we take risks for Christ's sake, we show that we're willing to learn. And oftentimes that is exactly where we need to be for the church to grow. But it is God's call to us in Christ who is the Amen. You know, that word amen comes from a Hebrew word that means foundation or faithful or trustworthy. Christ as the amen means that Christ is God's yes, God's yes to us. We as God's beloved need to know this. We live in a world where people have been hurt all too often by each other, and especially by the church. So, how will we convey God's yes to others? Well, here at Silver Spring Presbyterian Church, we do that in part by serving at Downtown Daily Bread and New Hope Ministries through our ROAR team, through opening up our buildings and grounds for the community use, through our annual fall fair, which as you heard in the announcements this morning will be a fall festival. But we could be doing even more. What if we walked the neighborhood together? What if we talked to our neighbors around the church and figured out what it is that they need and what would be meaningful for them to join in fellowship together? What would be meaningful ways for us to serve them? What could you do to convey God's yes to others? Friends, the good news is that Christ still knocks. Christ still pursues us. Christ still calls us. We need only to respond. It's risky business but it's worth it. Amen.
Thank you, Jane, for that beautiful message. Um, I know I can relate to today's sermon say very much. In the past, my faith has been lukewarm, and I know it'll become lukewarm again, but I take comfort in knowing that I remember what God has brought me through in life and what he will continue to bring me through and the doors he will continue to open for me um, because he has opened many doors for me. And one of the, I came across a saying that I've always loved and forgive me if I, I'm not word for word, I might butcher it here a little bit, but um, faith is not necessarily knowing what path you're going to walk. It's knowing and trusting the Lord that he will put you where you need to be and where he wants you. It's just trusting in the Lord that he will do that for you, which is not always easy, um, but it's it couldn't be further from the truth. So thanks again, Jane, for your sermon today. Join me now in a time of prayer. Please bow your heads as we come before God. Lord God, we stand in awe of your grace and your goodness. Even in this season of darkness, when we are stalked by the specters of disease, of economic depression, racism, and political polarization, when truth at even the highest levels of our government is disregarded in favor of political ambition, we praise you knowing that we can always trust in your provision and your justice. We thank you especially for the gift of your grace in Jesus Christ. We are grateful that in him we have come to know you and your love, and that trusting in him, 
we might all know new life, life that really is life. We thank you for his example of what that life looks like, for showing us how we are to share your love by working, by working for wholeness, for justice, for all, and especially those whom Jesus called the least. And we thank you for the inspiration of your Holy Spirit to guide and empower us in working for your kingdom. Even so, we know we have not lived fully into Jesus' vision of your kingdom. In our day-to-day -day lives, we have failed to consider the needs of the least, and we have ignored the lonely and the lost. Lord, forgive us. We pray you might give us new hearts and write on them your commandment to love you with our whole being and our neighbors as ourselves, just as Jesus showed us to do, that we might do this each and every day. And so it is in Jesus' name that we confidently come before you with our prayers of intercession this morning. We pray for your church, especially this congregation, that we in the Silver Spring family of faith might be more than lukewarm disciples, that in all ways we might be faithful to you and to your word. Bring us closer to you and closer to one another. Unite us in Jesus Christ so that whatever our differences are, we might become one in him. We pray for all who are sick and suffering and for those who treat them, even at the risk of their own well-being. We hold up to you all who grieve the loss of loved ones. And now we name in the silence of our hearts or aloud or in the chat field, the names of those who in our lives are in special need of prayer. Lord God, comfort them and assure them of your constant love and protection. We hold up to you now all who are seeking work. Lord, direct them quickly to the new places of employment that you have already picked out for them. Guide our business and government leaders in making decisions that reflect your compassion and care as they affect the well-being of all workers and their families. Inspire us to care more deeply for the earth. Fill us with gratitude for this natural blessing that you created to sustain and nurture all your children. Lead our scientific and political leaders to identify and implement new and sustainable ways of powering our lives and lead us to be more faithful stewards of your creation by adopting sustainable practices that we already know. And now, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go now in God's love, knowing that sometimes we have to take risks for our faith but we are God's beloved. And so take those risks that other people might know Jesus too. And as you go, go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit. Go now in peace, amen.